Okay, well, I want to welcome everybody to the, the meeting of the minds today by Dementia Alliance International. Um, today's topic is, is sexuality and dementia, rights, risks, and responsibilities um, by Rhonda Ney, uh, Emeritus Professor at La Trobe University. Did I pronounce that right, Rhonda? Yep, that's correct. And, and Rhonda Ney uh, is a emeritus professor there. Prior to her retirement in 2013, she had variously been a professor of uh, geriatric nursing, professor of inter interdisciplinary aged care, director of numerous research institutes and centers, including the Dementia Training Studies Center, uh, Victoria and Tasmania and the Victorian hub of the Dementia Collaborative Research Center, Consumers and Carers, Head of Nursing at La Trobe and the University of New England, President of AAG Victoria, a director on the board of Aged Care Accreditation Agency. She has had extensive experience on government, industry, and professional boards and, and committees, and advised a long line of changing government ministers. Rhonda has been a member of AA and worked closely with both national and state Alzheimer's projects. And I assume that's Alzheimer's Australia when they say yeah. AA, just so people don't think it's Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> And uh, her research on sexuality dates back to 1987 and has remained an ongoing interest. DAI is very lucky she has agreed to give, it, to give her time to present to our members and supporters. And, and with that, Rhonda, I, I also want to echo our, my appreciation of you uh, giving this presentation today, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Uh, just a couple of things up front. If my um, slides aren't showing because of the pictures, let me know. If my Australianisms are not understood by some people, um, I'm sure you can butt in on John and ask me to explain. And um, I hope that there are lots of interesting questions at the end. One of the less formal positions I held, um, which I didn't know about, was when I received a phone call from someone asking me if I was the, the professor of sex. And I thought, gee, maybe, you know, I've been talking about this too much. But it certainly is... Um, the topic over, I think my career spanned about 46 years and sexuality was the one thing that I had most requests either to talk about um, or to consult on in aged care facilities. And I think uh, a lot of that is to do with the fact that people don't want to talk about it. It is an issue out there, um, but it's uh, embarrassing for people to talk about, despite the fact that it's everywhere you look sex sells when it comes down to talking about our own sexuality or the sexuality of our partner we suddenly clam up and don't want to talk about it so yeah i'm delighted um to have had the opportunity thanks to kate and all of you to talk a bit more about it this morning and i think particularly uh talking to people that i'm talking about um is really important because although we've interviewed uh, lots of people with dementia and other cognitive impairment about their sexuality and about what's important, um, obviously hearing back from you um, is, is much more important than hearing health professionals give their views about it. So with that, um, when talking about sex, I'm not just talking about intercourse or the sex act. Yes, we're talking about sex acts, physical acts, but it's also very much the emotions attached, what it is that makes us feel sexual, um, so the whole gamut of sexuality. And this is a, an old definition, but I think it, it sums up fairly well 
um, the, the integration of the romantic, emotional, intellectual and social aspects of sexual beings in, that are positively enriching and that enhance personality, communication and love. So, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious and probably doesn't need stating that we're not talking about um, sexual acts that are degrading um, or not, cons you know, where the people are not consenting. Why is it important? Research going back at least to 1986 has shown how important sexuality is to our identity. It's very much at the centre of who we are. And if you stop and think about the first question we ask when someone, well, even earlier now, I was going to say when someone has a baby, it's, do you know what the sex is? And from that moment, we start to treat that person in a different way, depending on whether it's a girl or a boy. We start to try and mould them into our social expectations of what is a boy, what is a girl. <coughs> Excuse me, and our sense of self um, is, is affected by the way in which um, people define us. And the marvellous Foucault said it's the truth of our being, it's, it's who we are. So it's not something that we can just ignore um, because people have grown older or because they have uh, cognitive impairment. The other thing about sex is it's really good for us. Um, work that I'm aware of shows that it reduces pain, it reduces depression, it improves our self-esteem in relationships. It's a great way to lose calories if you're into weight loss. Um, and I've noticed in the UK, it's even starting to be prescribed by doctors. I've got funny pink things all over my screen coming up. Have you got them? No? So um, over the years, with literally dozens of presentations and lectures, I've said to people to write down what they think of when they think of sex, their own sex, then what, how the media portrays sex and what they need in order to feel sexual. The typical responses in relation to their own sexuality was things like romance, intimacy, hygiene, companionship, sex, love, privacy, and usually the younger blokes that say alcohol. But then when you look at the media sexuality, you've got a whole different set of things. Youthfulness, people would say beauty, but if you ask them to unpick that, then beauty meant slim body, muscles, firm breasts, sexy clothes on perfect models, and I remember one young fellow saying, at least guys don't have to worry about things sagging. So I said, well, actually, when you've seen as many old scrotums as I've seen, you'll realise that's not true. He wasn't so smart after that. No wrinkles, grey hair or cellulite. So you can see there's a very big difference between our own sexuality and, our me and the media sexuality. And if I ask, <coughs> excuse me, 400 people, um, you know, have you had sex in the last week? Uh, a lot of the hands would go up, despite the fact that they didn't fit with the media presentation. So while that um, ideal, if you like, picture of sexuality is out there, the reality is that we remain sexual, even though we don't fit that image. In terms of feeling sexual, um, I often think of an example of going to the dentist and because I'm terrified of dentists, I try to cover that up when I go in by being very flirtatious and, you know, full of cheek. But then, of course, you've got spit running down your face and half it doesn't work and the last thing you feel like on the way out is even being seen. People talk about romance, hygiene, body image, feeling loved, uh, uh, mentioned alcohol, soft clothing, dim lights, music. All of these things are relevant um, to how we feel sexual. None of them are actually related to age. 
<coughs> excuse me, um, or cognitive impairment. Now this again um, is, is very old, but hasn't changed over the years. And common attitudes are that older people don't have sexual desires, they're not able to make love even if they want to, they're too fragile and might hurt themselves. I suspect that must be when they fall out of bed. I'm not sure. Older people are physically unattractive and sexually undesirable and the whole notion of them engaging in sex is shameful and perverse. If you haven't ever done it, ask a group of people, particularly younger people, if their parents have sex. And they'll all cover their faces and say, Ugh, yuck! They don't even want to think about it. And you need to keep that in mind when we talk about whether your children should be able to make decisions about whether or not you can be sexually active um, if you are at a point in dementia where they think they ought to be able to make decisions for you. And I'm sure, as you'll tell me, very often kids think that way before you do. This Rhonda, is great. Yeah? I just got a quick question. We're still, everyone still sees the very first slide you had up here. What, 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 is it supposed to still be on, this, on the first one or not? No. They're moving along on mine. What do you think the problem is? Um, gosh. I'm really not sure because I'm not familiar with, with the type of client you're... Is that better? Oh, now it changed. Ah, okay. I had something up the front about um, pausing the uh, sharing. Oh, yeah. Now they're jumping around, uh, or maybe you're moving them. Now it shows slide nine of 24, but all we had previously seen was slide one. Okay. Well, you don't want me to go back over them, do you? No. Or do you? It, it, I is don't this know. Available? This is available to people when I finish? We can make it available, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Um, Why don't we do that? And there's some lines. Yeah, okay. I don't know where the, the lines are coming from that are on there. Squiggly, pink lines. Um, uh, pink things. Yeah, I don't know Pink where things. Are. Yeah. They seem to be increasing. <coughs> I started out with only one. Hmm. Um, Interesting. Never I seen that. I don't know what to do. Must be some kind of thing between the two different softwares or something. They weren't there yesterday. It's obviously a... a Pommy intervention. Yeah, it's it's something to do with. You're just with... trying to make Australians look useless. <laughs> um, it's a conspiracy. Let me see. It is a conspiracy. I, um, it, it um, might... I'll I'll push on and. Um, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> see what happens. Okay. Okay, so. We're talking about the sorts of things that make you feel, um, sorry, I have Sjogren's and it gives me a very dry throat. Um, so I was saying that although this is very old, it hasn't really changed over the years. So older people don't have sexual desires. This is common attitudes, not, not fact. Um, and the whole notion of older people engaging in sex is shameful and perverse. We don't want to see it. We don't want to see photographs of older people um, acting sexually. Although it is improving, um, you will see a few more movies now with uh, older people being sexual, but it's still um, not common. This is a fantastic study. Um, and although it's old, I love to keep quoting it because the further you go back, the more likely older people were to deny their sexuality because it was seen as perverse. 
So I would say this is the tip of the iceberg. These are people from age 80 to 102. So you can imagine if you go back to younger rotset dementia, um, the figures are probably a lot higher too. So 30% of females and 63% admitted to having intercourse. 10% of females and 29% of males have intercourse often. 71% of females and 88% of males fantasised. And I always like to comment when I get to this one, the, um, the do-gooding um, occupational terrorists who go around and, you know, they don't like to see an old person just sitting, staring into space. They want to make them do something. So I say to them, well, before you interrupt, you need to stop and think, you know, maybe they're in the midst of their best fantasy ever. 40% of females and 72% of males masturbate. Now, remember the age group we're talking about. And there are lots of reasons, which I'll get to in a minute, why this could be a problem, but you've still got a large proportion. And from the next two, you can see that, um, you know, we don't become goody two-shoes as we get older either, that even though we may not have a marriage partner, we still like to uh, engage in our sexual liaisons. There are things that um, a normal ageing um, erectile dysfunction, drying of the vagina and so on, um, can impact on our sexuality, but there are ways of dealing with that. But there are also other conditions like arthritis, chronic pain, depression, incontinence, orthopaedic surgery, hemorrhoids, um, stroke, diabetes, cancer, prostatectomy and so on, that can challenge our normal sexuality. Examples of drugs found to have a negative impact. Have a look at them. How many of those are increasingly prescribed, um, you know, as we get older? Do health professionals discuss sexuality? No, in droves. They're embarrassed by it. I don't want to talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry about my voice. <coughs> um, is it abuse to prescribe treatment without discussing side effects? Yes, I'd say it is. We actually develop, and the reason that they don't is because they're ageist and they don't think that they're more likely to discuss it with younger people. And the older you get, the less likely they are to actually talk about it. Yes. Um, we right? Still there? Yeah. Yeah. I just got a message to say I was unstable and I thought, yes, that's true. Um, so we developed a tool that is a, a, an assessment tool to try and help health professionals actually start talking uh, about sexuality and dementia. Um, that's available. You can um, find that on the internet and I've got the address there as well. So if you've got sex, old age, and remember that old is 10 years older than your health professional, and dementia, you've got triple jeopardy. They're all stigmatised. We staff think family thinks we have a duty to protect. We think how on earth can they possibly consent? You know, from the, we know that from the moment a diagnosis is made, there is this sense of people can't make decisions about anything, they've got to be protected, um, they must give up driving instantly, they can't consent to research, so how could they possibly consent to sex? We're only just <clears throat> beginning to acknowledge that people with dementia feel pain. I have a PhD student who's looking at pain and it makes you want to cry when you realise that health professionals, a lot of them, still assume that if a person has dementia, then they don't feel the pain because they don't verbally say they do. People with dementia are not as you would um, tell me, the demented. 
They're still human. They're still hungry, thirsty, cold, hot. They still need to feel human, to be touched, loved, treated with dignity. They still feel pain, that should be. And they still have the need to feel and act sexual. They are people who want to be involved in decisions that affect them. There's quite a lot of uh, misinformation, I think, about people with dementia and inappropriate sexual behaviour. In fact, it's very rare. Um, one study I looked at, it was 3.8% of 80, 7% of 178, 1.8% of over 2,000, and they had one caregiver complaint from 55 interviewed. So you can see that it's, it's something that gets <coughs> sensationalised, <coughs> um, but it's, it's actually very rare. It's more common in dementia that's alcohol-related, frontotemporal and Huntington's. A study that looked at hypersexual behaviour across 47 frontotemporal and 58 Alzheimer's disease found only six from the frontotemporal group and none from Alzheimer's disease. It's even rarer that there's sexually aggressive behaviour. So, you know, the newspapers blow it up, the nursing unions blow it up, but it's actually quite rare. And in fact, there is, uh, if you look at what is <coughs> called um, inappropriate behaviour, it is very often related to the staff values rather than the behaviour itself. Behaviours that we consider, excuse me, I'm not crying, um, considered normal in private. Um, masturbation, intercourse, groping, nakedness. If you look at the cricket, we know that genital scratching is considered normal whether you're in private or in public. But there are lots of things we do that are um, considered perfectly normal if, if we're private. If aged care facilities, for example, don't provide that privacy, then it's, it's not the behaviour that's a problem. It is actually the fact that that organisation has not provided privacy. Oh, I'm sorry about my throat. So health professionals are unsure how to or even if they should talk to clients about their sexuality. We did a study here and surveyed all of the aged care facilities the vast majority had no information whatsoever. If the sexual expression is outside their view of normal, um, it's an even greater threat to them. Fears are greater when the person has dementia, um, you know, they're being taken advantage of. And how can they possibly consent? Do we know they're consenting? And what is our duty of care to protect? And what about the families? How much say should families have? Families, <coughs> excuse me, have a tendency to assume um, that mum is being sexually molested. And she's probably enjoying that. And the ethical dilemmas, um, which I'm sure you've all seen roaming on the internet recently, of using dementia. Um, either as a, a mitigating circumstance to get out of um, court cases um, or I've forgotten what the next one was. So it's terribly important to actually do an assessment to find out whether or not we're looking at is um, sexual behaviour, what's causing it, before we start thinking about what we should do about it. So is it sexual behaviour? Is it a sexual need or is it expressing something else? Are people bored? Is it a need for touch? Is it about control, self-esteem? I nursed a fellow a long time ago who in fact had 
was being very uh, sexually inappropriate with the staff. And when I talked with him, he in fact was a uh, had um, had his genitals um, basically blown off in the war, and so it was very much about him trying to establish that he was still a man. And once we were able to get through that and get him some counselling, then the so-called uh, inappropriate behaviour stopped. Is it our moral problem? Um, in another situation, there was a gentleman in uh, a nursing home who wanted the staff member to put a DVD in for him, which was sexual in nature. As he said, you could actually see worse on daytime television than what he actually had on his DVD. But the staff member put in a formal complaint that she was being sexually harassed um, because she had to, she didn't have to watch it, she just had to take the video out and put it on for him. And that was very much about her religious and moral background. Is it a family problem? Um, as I said earlier, children, whatever their age, hate to think that their parents are sexual and so if there is some sexual behavior happening they will sh you know in, in for all the best reasons want to stop it and sometimes for the worst reasons because they're afraid they'll lose their inheritance is it the environment so if a, if a person's masturbating we know that's perfectly normal so it's not inappropriate behavior it's an inappropriate environment and we just need to change the environment. Are both people expressing yes or no? Um, if both people are expressing yes, then what's the problem? Whether we are talking about people with dementia or people generally, if one person's expressing no, it's a problem. So it, it, it's no different if the person has dementia. Are we expecting more consent than we would of others? We have kids roaming the street every day and night, high on drugs, alcohol, having sex. We don't rush out and stop them because we say they can't consent. It only becomes an issue if the question of rape or abuse comes into it. So we are expecting a lot more by way of um, consent, assent, from people with dementia than we do from the everyday person on the street. So we, we should do a full assessment um, before we decide how we're going to respond. We need to talk about it and get over our own inhibitions. There needs to be an agreed policy if it's an um, aged care facility, hospital. The person with dementia if at all possible, has to be involved in any discussions. We need education on all of the isms, whether it's ageism, um, dementiaism, whatever. Talking about it as something normal, um, touch, privacy, respect, self-esteem, etc. We need built environments that provide privacy and good role models. If you have um, GPs, senior staff who are freaked out by sexual behaviour, that's going to flow on to the other staff as well. For staff who simply can't cope, then I think they need to, we give them a developmental opportunity and then we move them on. Drugs are often used um, to reduce sexual behaviour. They should only be used if the sexual behaviour threatens the rights of other people and you've tried everything else and it doesn't work. So person-centred care, we're all bandying it about and, you know, we have to be person-centred, we need to talk about consumer choice. But it's empty rhetoric when we have people's sexuality, which, going back to the start of the presentation, is central to who a person is. And if we ignore that or ban it by moving people apart and people with dementia have no voice, it's not person-centred care. The problem usually is not with the behaviour but the lack of privacy, staff and family attitudes. 
It's not very hard to determine if a person with dementia is happy or resisting. In fact, I would say people with dementia are more honest in their responses than people without dementia. So it's very easy to see that they are not happy. Um, some of you will know this better than me, but I think it's summed up quite nicely that it's not about our views as in um, people other than the person with dementia, but civil rights. We're here to create an environment that allows grown-ups to do what grown-ups do. I put some references on the back there and some other useful links um, for publications from the research that we've done. You'll find them on the bottom one with Rhonda Ney, obviously. Um, and with that, I think I would like to stop and take questions or have general discussion. Okay, great. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, what I would ask people to do is you are able to unmute yourselves, but please do it uh, one at a time when you want to ask a question. And then once you're done, uh, mute yourself again so that any noise going on around you doesn't leak into uh, the webinar because it gets uh, rather awful when when we have a, a lot of different noises coming in from different sources so I appreciate it uh, let's see did we have any John you did send me a couple do you want me to start with them yeah yeah start off with those that's great okay um, <clears throat> excuse me from Brett Partington um, and these, I think, are fairly typical questions that I would get at a conference. Um, I knock on the door, announce myself, then walk into a residence room, so clearly it's residential care. The person with dementia is having sexual conduct with another resident with dementia, not their married partner. What's the best protocol in dealing with this situation? My first response to that would be to say were the people with dementia able to say come in or stay out because if they were then why did the person knock and walk in on them um, and I think this is fairly typical of so-called privacy where we knock but we don't wait for a response we knock and walk straight in um, so the first thing uh, by way of response I would say is that um, the staff member probably should not have been in there in the first place. If, um, let's just assume that then happened, if two people are engaged in sexual conduct and both are perfectly happy about it, I would walk out, close the door and let them get on with it. Um, whether or not you need to discuss this with um, the, the spouse or um, I guess is whether or not the person has um, a power of attorney. And I think that how we respond to sexuality in long-term care should start before anybody's admitted. So it's really about having a conversation with the people with dementia, with their spouse with the family to say this is our policy we are supportive of the person's sexuality and this is why um, you know in these situations these are the sorts of things we will do so it's it's not something that suddenly hits a spouse or a family member after the act that you've told them before what your policy is if they don't like it then I guess they'll go somewhere else but if you've had that conversation and you've agreed with the spouse that you will, um, they have uh, power of attorney, then yes, I guess you've got to tell them. If they don't, um, unless it is a situation where you have questions about abuse, then I'm not sure I'd even have the conversation. Um, 
it is about the individual person's right. Certainly, if it's the family, um, I would think it was none of their business unless, as I said, they have the legal right to know. Um, does there have to be a report made? No, not unless there's abuse. Um, it's nobody's business. Uh, do I have any tips for handling delicate situations with dignity and respect? Well, I've probably covered that. I mean, I think it's really about making sure that people know what your policy is up front. Um, if it is a situation, um, it's a little bit like, you know, we don't report to everybody if a person's well, we report if something's gone wrong. If a person is having uh, a sexual situation and everyone seems happy, then I'm not quite sure why we would need to report it. If they were at home having a sexual situation, it would be nobody's business. Um, why would we need it? You know, if they were talking to their GP, the GP does not actually have the right uh, to tell the spouse unless um, they have a, a legal position. At least that's the situation in Australia. Does that answer the question, Brett, if you're there? I don't know if that person could be on by, f oh, Brett, right? Yep. Brett, can you hear us? It's all right, other people can respond. Okay. Um, we did have a question input here in the uh, chat box that said, I've had questions about abuse when it is the spouse and the person living with dementia does not want to have sex with their spouse in the facility. Yeah, um, we've had that situation too. And I, I think it is an extension of what I was just talking about. If a person says no, um, whether they're married or not, it is abuse. Uh, I'm sorry, whether they're in a facility or at home, it's abuse. You have the right to say no. And so if um, we had a situation where a couple had had, uh, in fact, I think there was another one on the news, where a couple had had an excellent sexual relationship, they were married, <coughs> and the person then, the person with dementia then, did not wish to continue having sex, didn't recognise the husband as such, they then have the right to say no, and if the, we'll say husband, uh, forced the issue, that would be abuse. Does that answer the question? It was from Alice. Um, and, uh, there was a another question that says, what powers do a person holding POA have, the power of attorney have? Um, depends on whether, <coughs> excuse me, it's enduring or medical, and I guess it varies from uh, not only our states but countries. Um, but if they have overall power of attorney, then in one way they have ultimate power. So, yes, they can make a decision for that person. However, uh, if that is perceived to be not in the interests of the person with dementia, that can then be contested, uh, you know, at a tribunal or the courts or the complaints offices, depending <clears throat> on what you have in your country. So if the... Um, power of attorney does not appear to be acting in the interests of the person with dementia, staff, GP, other people, other family members can actually appeal that. Okay, thank you. Um, and I would uh, say should. We had, uh, Rhonda, we had a case here in, in, in my state, which is Iowa in the U.S., uh, that happened, uh, you know, living with a diagnosis myself, sometimes it's hard for me to place time, but I believe it was last year where 
um, a man whose spouse, and this was a second marriage for both of them, both of them were, uh, their spouses had died, and all four of them were good friends together when their spouses were alive. After each one of them's spouses had passed, they remarried to each other. And after so many years, she was diagnosed with, with one of the forms of dementia. Uh, apparently, I don't know if it was potentially through a process that the daughter petitioned the court for power of attorney, but somehow her daughter got power of attorney and um, believed that her, her mom should be placed in a, in a care facility at a certain point and not stay, even though the husband wanted her to stay home with him. And so she was placed in a care facility and um, he was warned by the staff that she no longer had the mental capacity to form consent to, to sexual nature and um, they believed they had sufficient evidence that he had sex with her and he was charged with a crime. And this was a man that was a, a lawmaker in our state, had been for a very long time. Um, you know, it was a rather traumatic case, but it, I would say it was pushed more so by probably the daughter who that was not her father, that was her stepfather, and it just sounded like, from all accounts, she was the one pushing for there to be criminal charges, and and he was acquitted on the charges. But um, there was no detectable signs that she objected to the sexual contact. But the nursing home said she did not; she no longer formed the legal capability to consent to it. Do you believe that that once people aren't able to verbally communicate that they should, that anybody should be able to say, okay, you can no longer consent to it? No. I mean, <laughs> Absolutely no. I, I actually followed that case and, and commented on it a couple of times. And I thought it was uh, sort of a, typical of what happens so often when we assume that the moment a person gets a diagnosis of dementia or they can't verbally communicate, that we have a right to take away their rights. And I think a, a wonderful example of how we understand nonverbal communication um, is Mr Bean. You know Mr Bean, I assume? Mm -hmm. Mr Bean rarely speaks and yet we never have any problem working out what the message is. Um, I think, and someone will correct me, that something like 70% of our communication is nonverbal. And yet, for some reason, if people get dementia and are post verbal, we assume they can no longer communicate, which is absolute nonsense. Um, I would say, um, without exception, the people with dementia that I have uh, worked with right up until the point of death were able to communicate with their eyes, with their expression, um, with grimaces, with the same non-verbals we all communicate with. So to say that, yes, a person may not be able to meet the legal requirements for consent, but they can certainly dissent or assent. So I thought that was a, um, a case of, in fact, the GP was tied up in it as well, and I thought it was a case of ageism, sexism, um, pushing through a situation that never should have happened. 
Um, you know, the fact that the daughter, and unless there's something that I'm not aware of, but on the basis of everything that I read, um, the husband was very badly treated and I was pleased to see he was acquitted. Yes, yes. Well, and, and, and you know, obviously I wasn't firsthand with all of the material facts and, and knowledge, but from, from what I read as well, the thing that bothered me was uh, it was reported by a roommate who was only separated by a, you know, material curtain. Divide, a curtain. And um, there was apparently absolutely no signs of the wife objecting or disagreeing with this activity. Um, so who is to say that, you know, I mean, it's just conjecture to say she didn't want to participate. Well, Aisha was probably, you know, it was the enjoyable moment of her life that day. Um, B, one would ask why, where you've got a husband and wife, they were in a room only separated by a curtain with someone else. I mean, they, that is not privacy. Yes. Um, and it's another example of, of how we get the housing wrong um, and then try and blame the victim. And, oh. you know, uh, if, if a person with dementia um, is unhappy with the situation, they will scream, they will grimace, they, you know, I mean, they don't, it, it's easy to tell unless they're comatose. Yes. Well, I, I've been a long, long time believer that that's, that's where behaviour problems quote behavior problems yeah. come from it's really people that don't no longer know how to communicate that they don't like what's going on so it comes out in other ways oh absolutely and it's it's much more often the people around them that have the behaviors because yes. the person with dementia is totally frustrated that no one will listen no one will observe um you know it's it confounds me that we are so appalling as a society in reading body language when we do it all the time but when it comes to people with dementia all of a sudden you know we want to protect it's crazy yeah. there was another case running at the same time which was the other end of the spectrum and that was a fellow who was um up on pedophilia charges and he was trying to use the diagnosis of dementia um, to get off and I think he did uh, and then someone appealed it which I was pleased to see so you have the other side where in fact abuse has occurred and people try and use dementia as an excuse mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know you can't charge me now so I think um, you know, there's, there's an awful lot of awareness raising to happen about the fact that a diagnosis of dementia doesn't mean you can't make decisions anymore. Um, that being nonverbal doesn't mean you can't make decisions anymore. Right. right. Maybe I can't sign my will, but I can certainly let you know whether or not I want to take my medications, <clears throat> whether I want to have a shower, whether I want to eat pumpkin or potato and I can let you know if I'm enjoying sex you know it's it's part of who we are and we yeah. just put sex out there as if it's somehow this well it is taboo mm -hmm. agreed someone said Travis wants to talk Travis can you hear me yes can you hear me yes we can I have I have a question regarding spouses of people that have dementia. I work in a dementia unit, an assisted living facility, and um, we have one resident in particular who expresses sexual interest in a couple of other residents. And her husband comes to visit her um, pretty much every other day. 
and uh, I understand it's it's her right, and she has a need for uh, sexuality. But I'm wondering because when he comes, I can see the the part of him that feels so uncomfortable. But then I can also see the part of him that understands she has dementia. Um, is there anything I can do or say to bring some more comfort to him, make him feel uh, a little more easy with it, or is there just nothing that I can do to help him? Uh, yeah, I think you can always help people. And I think, you know, often um, still uh, your everyday person doesn't really understand dementia, so part of it is about ensuring that they understand that it's not just this sort of psychological symptom that they should be able to control, but showing them, you know, how parts of the brain are impacted, how that affects the way in which we behave and, and helping them, helping him to get a better understanding of what's going on in the brain. Um, the other thing is um, some people, and I don't know if he's one of them, have actually said, look, I'm okay, I understand this behaviour, but I would just ask that when I'm here, um, I can see my wife or husband without these other people being there. So, you know, it may be that by creating a space where the husband can be with the wife um, without the other people being around that um, she has an affection for, that that will be enough to reduce um, his pain, discomfort. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, it may be that they, if it's nice weather, they can sit out in the garden or you've got a special room that you can set up for them um, and just make sure that the other people aren't there. It's, a, it's hard. Yeah, it, it is hard and it's a, it's a tricky situation. Um, but... Yeah, I think that's a great idea to have them have a private room to where uh, there's not the other residents that she's interested in with her. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Pleasure. I think it's, uh, Rhonda, I think it's interesting that from talking to uh, people in the past that work in uh, care facilities that the thing I've been told most frequently is when um, when someone is in a care facility and uh, especially if they're married and of course the spouse does is not in the care facility. Um, in fact, one one particular instance I'm that came to mind was a situation where the spouse didn't visit too often, wasn't there much, and the person in the care facility had struck up a close friendship with a female, and they kind of acted you know, interacted like they were a married couple and, and formed a real bond. And this upset this man's children to no end. And they kept telling the staff, you have got to put a stop to that. He's a married man. Well, mm -hmm. you know, I, I understand it causes some, some, uh, emotions for family to deal with, but you have to understand where that person is in their journey and that if, if it's making their days better to have that relationship with that person, I think we have to respect that. Absolutely agree with you. And, you know, you, you ask uh, adults whether or not their children should interfere in their sex lives and that also, of course not. Just because a person has a diagnosis of dementia doesn't give the kids the right to say it's making me uncomfortable, don't do it. Right. Um, you know, I, I think, I think that um, I like to think the majority of people are okay. 
and that if you can explain to them that this is making the day of the person better, that they will come round. But, of course, there are some people who are mean and nasty all their lives and you're going to have difficulty with them and they're the cases where it may end up going to a tribunal or finding someone, um, you know, so it may be that it's a religious thing and you may be able to contact someone that the family member will listen to and educate them and get them to support the family member, you know, if they're not listening to you. So trying to use a conduit um, to get that person to accept the right of the person with dementia. Um, the other thing I think um, it just flashed through my mind a moment ago about the, the issue of um, inappropriate, challenging, whatever you want to call it, behaviour. And language can be a big thing there too. And I'm thinking um, uh, an issue that's often brought up is... Um, that the person with dementia grabs my boobs or grabs me somewhere else. And if you think about the language of, for example, having a shower, um, if someone says, we're going to have a shower now and starts taking your clothes off, for 99% of people, for 99% of their lives, that is a sexual act. We don't normally get in the shower naked with someone if it's not sexual. So if staff members, whether it's in the community or a facility, are actually going to rip someone off and help them shower, then number one, they should make sure they keep their boobs and other bits you know, out of the way. They need to have a sense of humour so that if they are grabbed, they can sort of... Um, make little of it and get out of the way. Uh, but also the language, um, you know, you don't say we are now going to get in and have a shower because that's quite different to I will help you have a shower. Um, you know, so I think thinking about how we say things, when we say them, um, the approach we take to uh, nudity, getting a person into bed and so on. We need to think about our body language and our verbal language when we're talking to somebody um, who can misinterpret that. Yes. I agree. For heaven's sakes, we've got to have a sense of humour. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we all take it so damn seriously. And I actually had a, a young nurse... Um, put it in a case of sexual harassment because an older man kissed a hand and I thought, oh, for God's sake, you know, what have we come to? <laughs> I would think it was delightful if an old bloke kissed my hand or whistled or, you know. It's, we've just got so politically correct and the humour's all gone. Well, uh, kissing someone's hand back whatever number of years was a... a sign of high respect was it not oh absolutely absolutely <laughs> and i mean i still do it i'll walk into a meeting and you know put the hand over to glenn reese and, and he kisses it and we laugh yeah um, you know i mean I, I i just think we if you're going to work in those facilities you've got to have a sense of humor yeah. you just have to you can't yeah. take it seriously you've got to be able to laugh it off and move on to the and unless um, it is serious aggression where somebody's going to be harmed. Right, and right. like I said, that's very rare. Yeah. And I think it requires a, a good assessment to see, first of all, what you did wrong that may have caused it, not just jump to the assumption that, oh, it's the dementia, which so often happens. Right. Let me see here. Nick, did you have a question? Uh, yes, I did, John. Um, I wonder a couple of things. Going back to uh, uh, the uh, lady uh, knocking on the door and walking in, to me that's yep. training. And um, um, I always think of the case where 
a, a person can be sitting in their room and um, the, uh, the nurse or whatever barges in and says, okay, we're going to go to bingo now in a loud and loud <laughs> voice, instead of walking in gently and quietly, sitting down, um, uh, looking at the person at eye level and saying, okay, Fred, um, uh, bingo's on now. Would you like to go to bingo? If not, tell me what you want to do. Yep. Um, it comes and that happens all the time. You know, you're going to have a shower, you're going to clean your teeth. Mm. Um, it's interesting, uh, another place that I worked, or actually I was out with students, and, you know, we would goes to labelling um, at handover, which again is a horrible term, they referred to this woman as um, demented and aggressive. When I went down with a student, she had a burn that required dressing. And the first thing I saw was that she was lying in the sun on the floor in the lounge room on a yoga mat, totally exposed and sitting around the walls, of course, were men and women. And the... Um, handyman, whatever he was, just without saying anything, bent down, scooped her up, and, of course, she screamed and kicked like hell and then sort of dropped her on a bed for us to do the dressing. To cut a very, very long story short, it turned out that this woman was very, very deaf, um, which I think goes back to Agnes. And so not only were they... Um, you know, not ensuring that she heard what they were saying, but because they immediately assumed that she was going to be aggressive and didn't take account of the fact that they were causing it, you got this vicious cycle of them not bothering to tell her what they were doing, you know, jumping in, ripping dressings off that hurt, not giving pain relief, treating her as an object, um, you know, leaving her naked in front of the men. Once... Um, I was able to talk um, through her deafness, if you like, so she could hear me, there were absolutely no problems. You know, she, it was just the fact that people had not um, worked out that she was deaf and taken actions to ensure that she could understand what it was they were going to do and enable her to make some choice about that. It Horrible comes, stuff. It comes back to the staff finding out a lot more about each, each resident, finding out what their needs are, finding out what they want to do, not what they're told to do. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. And, and again, I think there are lots of ways I'm <clears throat> working on some stuff at the moment. But, you know, it's, it's even if the person is post-verbal, um, there are ways of, you know, showing pictures, music that they can hear and so on to, to so that they can tell you through nonverbal, um, you know, what it is that, yes, they like that music, no, they hate that, yes, they like dogs, no, they hate cats, whatever. So I think that we tend to rely too much on the family to get a history and not enough on the person with dementia themselves to tell us um, in whatever way they can what it is they like, what the history is, um, and, you know, putting together little booklets that families can keep later as mementos. But in the meantime, um, <coughs> excuse me, doing a, a real story uh, about this person, who they are, what they like, and, and it's not just, you know, I think we have a tendency to say family history. It's not just the history, it's who they are now and what they like now, which can, as we know, be different um, to what the family remembers. I always use the example that if I was in an aged care facility I just sat there all day and, and stared at the floor and everyone said, oh, don't worry about him. He's just cranky and he, 
he doesn't want to get involved in anything, um, how would they know what my interests are and how would they know that, that my main interest is uh, photography? Because yeah. I don't see anything. Absolutely. And I, I think that that's another issue that where a person is quiet and perhaps withdrawn, staff tend to ignore them because <clears throat> they're not causing any trouble. Yeah. Um, now, it may be that that person is very happily sitting there, reminiscing, looking at the scenery, doesn't want to play bingo, or, you know, has always been a loner. Or it may be that that person's got a serious depression that needs treating. And so I think what rather than staff just saying, come to bingo, or we'll just leave you sit there because you're not a nuisance, that there needs to be assessments not only of what people see as problematic behaviour, but also of, um, you know, quiet learner behaviour to see whether that's what the person enjoys doing. I mean, I just like to enjoy sitting by myself and not being disturbed by anyone a lot of the time too. Uh, so, you know, are they depressed and lonely or do they enjoy being a loner? Mm. Or do they love photographs? <laughs> you say that, I went into one aged care facility and there was a beautiful old man. He had one wall completely covered in photographs of his life. And I said to the lady involved, I said, if you look at those, there's a complete story behind each one. And you need to find out what those stories are. Yes. And then, of course, people will say we don't have time. I think the other issue, um, and, and this goes to those people who are um, still at home, is the, uh, the carer issues um we've done quite a bit of work on families and carers and so on and the the isolation that comes because the way society treats people with dementia who uh, don't behave in the way that they think is the norm um, causes embarrassment to the carer so <clears throat> there's a lot of work uh, to be done with our communities uh, to raise awareness, to educate them, so that, um, we, you know, to use the current jargon, that we've got dementia-friendly communities, but so that bank managers, um, coffee houses, whatever, are environments in which carers can feel comfortable to go and not feel embarrassed or stay at home and feel isolated. Excellent. Um, if, any, do, if anyone else has any questions, comments, um, you can either unmute yourself or you can uh, put it into the chat box and I'll be happy to read it out. Either way is fine if you want to unmute yourself and, and ask Ron anything, that's, that's fine as well. I think one of the other issues that's coming up uh, now as the LBGTI community is becoming um, more outspoken is that uh, facilities are only just facing what they see as the challenge of um, cross-dressing, transgender um, issues that, you know, they, they haven't even come to terms really with straight, married, homosexual sex. So the way that they respond to anything outside of that is even uh, more of a worry. And, you know, there needs to be a lot more. We keep saying education and we know that often education doesn't work. It, sometimes it has to be rules, laws. But I think most importantly, it's about leaders in communities role modeling appropriate behavior because we know that people are much more likely to follow the leader than to go and listen to an education program and then go back and change 
if their boss is not on board. I have I have a question regarding um, the LGBT. Um, if you have, do you think there's going to be more um, residents who were closeted for so long, and um, now we may be seeing them coming out with, I guess you could say, their true feelings? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, a lot of our uh, behaviour is socially constrained. Um, and, you know, one, one of the, the situations that I often faced was people who were holier than thou suddenly started saying all sorts of wicked swear words and the families were horrified and saying, you know, Dad never swore or Mum never swore. And, you know, similarly with um, sexual preference and so on. And, you know, I, I think often um, if there is a good side to dementia, it's the liberation um, that, you know, the, the sorts of things that our um, social constraints held in, you know, we can now say, bugger you, um, I'm going to do what I want to do and be who I want to be. So, yes, um, I can't um, tell you there's research that would support that, but my own view is that, um, often um, the um, social inhibitions are removed and we can do things that, you know, maybe before we wanted to do but didn't. Do you think there is any way that we can make the community more accepting and uh, more aware that they may all of a sudden express feelings for another sex? Um, only in the same way as with all other awareness. I think you just have to keep hammering it and hammering it. Facebook, Twitter, um, rallies, anything. Um, we've had um, a couple of very successful campaigns in Australia. One was on bad backs. Um, the other was uh, AIDS. And I think that you need to look at what campaigns have been really successful in your area and say, okay, let's now do that um, with dementia, with younger onset dementia, um, with issues around that, including um, sexuality. There's a lot of stuff going on raising awareness, of course, about the LGBTI, I don't think, Q um, in Australia at the moment and I suspect everywhere. Um, and I think that, you know, marrying, <coughs> excuse me, that with the awareness around dementia is a really good thing to do. But we still have, um, we've kind of taken the stigma to some extent out of incontinence because there was a, a big campaign. I, I'm not saying it's not still stigmatised, but it's reduced. So if you can get government on board and have those major public awareness campaigns through um, the, the sort of uh, technology that we now have and the younger people use, then I think we can start to make inroads. But I'm cynical enough to think that I won't see a hell of a lot of difference by the time I need it. When you mentioned AIDS, it brought up another question that I've had for quite a while. Um, I've heard about programs in facilities that are educating on the use of condoms and preventative measures against STDs. Um, do you feel that this uh, current generation that's primarily in the facilities, way back when they weren't really using a lot of these protective measures, do you feel it's necessary to try and educate them in the facility on the use of condoms and ways to prevent STDs? Um, if you're talking about people with dementia in facilities, that all depends on where they're at in relation to being able to pick up and remember new information. Um, 
certainly the STD issue is something that is getting, yes, I think we need to uh, have more education because certainly it's becoming more of an issue with older people. Um, but I ju you just reminded me, some of the facilities are facilitating people who uh, want to access sex workers. And we have some sex workers who uh, specialise, if that's the right word, in people with disabilities, people with dementia. Um, and what the facilities have done is to essentially treat the sex worker organisations the same as they would treat OTs or any other independent organisation. And so they've looked into their uh, registration, their record of safe sex practices and so on. So where you have people who are perhaps not able to um, take the initiative for safe sex, then you can educate the person with whom they may be having sex. Um, and if you have two people um, who have dementia, then I guess you um, have to look at ways in which you can uh, ensure that they're not... Um, it sounds ridiculous, really, but putting each other at risk um, through STDs. Rhonda, do you feel there's far more acceptance of LGBTI in the community now than what it was five, ten years ago? Oh, God, yes. Um, I had colleagues in Tasmania who got stoned. Um, <coughs> stoned. Um, yes, there's absolutely no question that uh, a lot of people um, are, A, quite proud to come out. Um, not so much in the older generations, which of course is why it's taken so long for this to come through to staff education. Um, but now I, I think that um, the, the acceptance, the... Um, it's kind of become a non-issue for an awful lot of people. Having said that, I think there are, are still people who are going to be um, sexist, ageist, whatever you want to call it, um, until they're in their grave. They're just bigots and that's, you know, nothing you do or say will change them. But by and large, I think there has been a huge uh, improvement. I know that... that um, We've got a long, long way to go, uh, but I, I don't think, I think a lot more people are now um, comfortable in their own sexuality and comfortable in accepting other people's. Uh, I think probably more work needs to be done. Uh, I think young kid, you well, you know, sort of teenagers who are, um, starting to wonder about their sexuality can often be given a hard time at school still. So there's no doubt there's still issues, but yeah, in short, I think it's better. The, um, the gay Mardi Gras is on in a few weeks. And the majority of people who go to that are not gay. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think there's a, I think there's a lot more support for um, equality, and that it's a hell of a lot better to love than it is to hate. True, true. I know a lot of people who go each year and they love it. They absolutely love it. It's pretty colourful. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Where was it? Linda. It's Linda here. Um, I think it'd be very nice if we could have a dementia float next year. Oh, I saw you. I saw your tweet or something about that. Yeah, I, I noticed the is it the Canadian Prime Minister President or something is 
leading a similar thing? Might have been yeah. on LinkedIn. Yes, no, uh, it was on Facebook. He's he's part of the Pride Parade in Canada. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think there was someone, um, Christine Nixon, who was the police boss, led it or went in it in Victoria one year. Anyway, it's good to hear your voice, Linda, and not just see your messages. Nice to meet you and see you too, Rhonda. I bet you that bloody Kate never made it. No, no, she's probably fast asleep. She was saying she felt so badly that she wasn't <laughs> going to be there. And I said, bullshit, you're going to be having a lovely time in London. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, she does, Kate does send her regrets. Uh, oh, sure, sure. But she messaged, messaged me a short time before that apparently, I don't know if it was schedule or internet connection, but she said, there's no way I'm going to be able to get on to the, the webinar. So don't make I'm, excuses for her. Oh, I'm, I, I, I'm not, I'm just. <laughs> Rhonda and John, there's a, it's Linda here. There's a question that, uh, on the group chat from someone, someone who'd love Rhonda to comment on the role reversal where the care partner is no longer interested in their spouse who's living with dementia and they want a sexual relationship with their spouse. In other words, the spouse has just decided or felt that because the person has dementia, that's it, no more sex. Yeah, and that was, uh, I, I was going to mention that, Rhonda, that was brought about by someone participating that said uh, she she lives with the diagnosis and since she's been diagnosed, her husband is no longer interested and that, that she felt that was very painful to her, which I can imagine. And so what what are your thoughts about when it's a reversal where where the, where the, uh, person not living with the diagnosis is all of a sudden not interested because someone is living with a diagnosis? Um, again, I, I think it is in some ways no different to your normal relationship. So if you have one person in a relationship who is wanting to have a sexual relationship and the other one doesn't, it's very painful. Um, the decisions you have to make about that, I think, are no different whether a person has dementia or not. Um, do you uh, try to have some sort of intervention, counselling, whatever, to see if you can get that sexual relationship happening again? Do you uh, assume it's a stage uh, the person's going through and that, you know, they may come back to being sexual or do you become celibate or do you say, well, I'll deal with it myself or I'll find someone else? You know, I mean, I think the fact that dementia is there in some ways um, is unnecessarily complicating the way you respond. I think, you know, you just think about it and respond as you would if the dementia wasn't there. You have a number of options, which one sits most comfortably with you. Right. I said to my partner um, years ago that if um, my health conditions led to a situation where I was no longer um, useful um, or capable sexually, that as far as I was concerned, he shouldn't have to suffer the same thing and he should, you know, go get it elsewhere, um, you know, so long as he continued to... Um, I guess love me as a person um, that I didn't want to I thought that if the restriction was there it could also lead to resentment and so I would prefer to give the same advice to him that I would give to uh, people with dementia people living with people with dementia and you know that is that you need to make some choices about um, it's not only is the person with dementia happy, but is the partner happy? Um, what are the options? 
Yeah. And it's, it's, it's brought up uh, the person living with dementia needs the care relationship with their spouse and cannot go elsewhere. And, and that can often be the case because of limitations of, on somebody living with a diagnosis as far right. as, you know, many aspects, mobility, a lot of aspects. So, but, uh, so yeah, that's a tough, difficult situation. Um, Just make a quick comment. Sure. Hi, Shibley. Uh, it's Shibley here. Yeah. It's just been announced officially that Kate Swaffer has been elected to join the World Dementia Council. Yee-hoo! Hooray! Yeah. So that has just been as a press release. I'm sorry to interrupt you all. Oh, no. I I thought you'd gone to sleep. It's time you spoke. (laughs) Uh, She probably has gone to sleep. I saw her today. She's been very busy. But great great presentation, Rhonda. I love the questions and answers too. Brilliant. Thank you, Shibley. Thanks, Gibbs. I think Kate's drunk. (laughs) Yeah, well, well, it's brilliant news. Yeah, that's great. Uh, This is Richard, and it's great news about Kate. And I was also had a kind of a comment on the the prior discussion that I I would suspect that the spouse who doesn't have dementia that is reluctant to have sex that a lot of that may be related to the very kind of judgmental and punitive attitudes that people have about it. I mean, he may be getting messages uh, from other people that are saying, well, gosh, you know, your wife has dementia. You can't, you know, have sex with her because she can't consent and, you know, whatever. Uh, And so I think that the points that, Rhonda, you've made during this are really important in terms of the imperative to do whatever we can to educate people and and overcome that stigma because I, in a way it imprisons both people uh, in a in a relationship and and I, and I think uh, 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 you know people just have enough to deal with with the disease itself without all the attitudes that people uh, throw at them. Yeah, I totally agree. Yes, that's that's a great point. And I, I myself felt like it was such a chilling effect when that case was filed in my own state uh, uh, against that guy. I thought, what a chilling effect on, on saying, you know, someone hits a certain point with a diagnosis, they can no longer consent to sexual activity what a chilling effect for for people like myself living with a diagnosis you know then 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 uh you know put me out of my misery if i can't i mean really (laughs) yeah the other chilling this is richard again the other chilling effect of that is that it causes fear in the part of the uh, administrators of, and staff of the homes because they read about these cases and they see that, I mean, because it wasn't just that the daughter pushed this in the lawsuit, then the Department of Public Health in the state came down real hard on the facility, uh, pushed the administrator out because he wasn't doing enough to prevent this nonsense and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it it just, it, it makes facilities very fearful of taking the kind of action that they really need to take in terms of uh, creating a, a free environment. Yes. Yeah. Totally, totally agree. Just before I forget, where's young Sandy and why is he not speaking to me? Your co-chair, isn't he? Uh, Sandy? Uh, Or do you mean uh, uh, Helga? 
No, 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 no. God, I've had a, I've had a junior moment. I can't think of his last name. He's done a lot of stuff on stigma in the states. Younger onset dementia. Is it Sandy Halperin? Yes. Yeah, Sandy is nine today. <laughs> Tell him I'm really upset. <laughs> okay. I will next time I talk to him. <laughs> um, yeah, I. The other thing I think is the extent to which um, people who, with dementia, or even older people who are still enjoying a sexual relationship, feel they have to hide it because of the stigma. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas young people kind of boast about it. When you get um, older or you are immediately written off as unable to make your own decisions, then it's kind of, um, it's almost an assumption that if a person with dementia is engaged in some sort of sexual act that it, that it wasn't consensual. And uh, given that most of us who have enjoyable sex lives actually find it a really good experience, then what's happening is that we are removing that good experience out of our sense of protecting, um, you know, which is benevolent oppression, really. You know, we'll decide what's good for you and we'll take away that which we think is not because, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't possibly consent to sex, you know. Mm -hmm. Crazy stuff. Yes, it is. Absolutely. Well, uh, unless anyone else has anything to uh, urgent to interject, uh, one thing I do want to mention that I was supposed to mention at the beginning, but I better get this in here or so I don't catch the catch uh, any grief about it, is that everything Dementia Alliance International does uh, is for informational purposes and is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice <laughs> from your own professional health care provider. So just want to make that, that stipulation. Nothing we ever do is a substitute for proper medical advice. Now, see, you're scared of being sued. <laughs> and, well, and you should be. You yeah. should be with me on. Yeah. yeah. Nowadays, people are too litigious. <laughs> um, well, can I just say that uh, I'm really grateful and I feel quite privileged, actually, to be in this position. Um, so thank you for having me on. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for the comments. And if, the, you, know, if you think of things after we shut up shop, um, I'm not sure whether you want them to go through John or if you want to just email me direct or Twitter or whatever, but I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation. Well, thank you so much, Rhonda, and thank you so much for, for being so generous with your time today. And uh, we, we, I personally have en enjoyed your presentation thoroughly, and, and it's so refreshing to have somebody talk sensibly and openly about a subject that often gets shoved in a closet. So it, I appreciate it. And thanks Let's stay to, passionate about sex. That's right. Absolutely. And thanks to everyone that's attended. We appreciate it. And have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Ditto. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>